If I, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. <clears throat> but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us and mold us. Fill us and use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. I give you thanks, O oh God, for the opportunity to gather together to see familiar faces or at least familiar eyes. And so as we are gathered, O oh God, I thank you for your spirit that has already fallen afresh on this place. So I pray that you would open our ears so that we could hear your voice today. Open our minds to help us understand your word. Open our hearts so that we can receive everything in love. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So tomorrow is a big day around our state. Who knows what the big day is? First day of school for most everybody. So I know Baltimore County starts tomorrow, Howard County starts tomorrow. Carroll County starts in a couple of weeks. Other than that, I don't care where everybody else is. Colleges, many have already started. And for some of our students, this is the first time they're going to be entering into their school building. My wife, Michelle, uh, teaches at a high school in Howard County, and they just had back to school night last week. And not only are the freshmen new to the building for the first time, but most of the sophomore class has never been in the building. So they have two classes out of four who have never been in the building. And so beginning tomorrow and then rolling out throughout the state, we begin a 10-month journey, a 10-month journey of scientific discovery and mathematical equations, navigating through history and trying to make sense of the English language. Did you know that the English language is the most studied language in the world. 1.5 billion people are learning to speak English. And I was thinking about that because just because English is popular doesn't make it an easy language. I mean, I was thinking about the, the peculiarities of our English language. So for example, how many of you say, let's get on the bus? You're allowed to raise your hands. You know I've said this before. You're not going to be mistaken for charismatics. Trust me. You say, let's get on the bus, except then you say, let's get in the car. So why do we say get on the bus and get in the car? I'm getting into both. Except for a short period of time in high school, I never rode on top of a vehicle. Car surfing was a big thing back then. Or, or phrases. Why do we drive on a parkway but we park on a driveway. 
Or what's that thing, I know different people call it different things. You have this appliance in your house that, that um, water comes out of, that you heat the water. And what do you call that? A hot water heater? Why do we call it a hot water heater? Who wants to heat hot water? Isn't it a cold water heater? I mean, think about it. And don't get me started on spelling. I have become the worst speller because all I look now is for the little squiggly line under all the words I misspelled. That's how I know I've misspelled them. Microsoft Word tells me I've misspelled a word. How many of you remember the whole, that little ditty, I before E except after C? I mean, it's been chanted for generations. I, I, in, in my research, I discovered this rule of spelling first appeared in an 1866 spelling manual. And uh, it became, the I before E except after C became known as the short form rule because they soon discovered they had to add a lot of exceptions. And so they republished the instructions in 1888 and so the phrase then became I before E, except after C, or when sounded like an A as in neighbor or way. Of course, then you have like the word weird, which is always spelled. So I want to see how well you remember your spelling. And here's the deal. You can either volunteer or you can be voluntold. So I need three volunteers. Okay, young lady. I already, t I already promised your sister, Christina, that I would call on you. I need a handheld. I need one more volunteer. It's got to be a guy, though. Okay, Richard, congratulations. I saw your, your wife nudging you. Could I get a handheld? Oh, I don't want you to spell? Maybe, yeah. I didn't say you had to spell it right. Oh, come on, one more volunteer. Come on up, my volunteers. I will volunteer somebody. Okay, come on up. Men that are here, very disappointing. All righty. We're going to make this easier. And it's really just to see if you remember I before E except after C. Right? Okay. We're going to have you stand up like a spelling bee. And there will be prizes. Mr. Richard will buy you whatever you want for a dollar. For a dollar. All right, we're going to start here. Spell the word friend. F-R-I-E-N-D. Correct. You get to move on to the next round. Spell the word ceiling. C-E-I-L-I-N-G. Correct. Yield. Y-I-E-L-D. Correct. Big hand. <laughs> round two. Start at this end. Receive. R-E-C-E-I-V-E. -E. R-E-C-I-E-V-E. -E. No, E-I-V-E. -E. I had to check. I don't know how to spell it. <laughs> I got it written down. Why would I have to know how to spell it? I already ran this through spell check. Thief. Thief? Thief. Oh, gosh. T-H-I-E-F? Correct. This is a hard one. And it depends on where you're from. Neither. N I E. T H E R. You were very close. If you just if you were in England, you might be right, because they say neither over there. But it's E I. No C in that one. I know it's confusing. Oh, these are hard. Ancient. A C I E N T. Close enough. There's an N in there someplace, but you're close enough. You win. C's. Not like, I'm going to seize the day, seize. Not like I see you, seize. Seize the day. Seize the day. Uh, S-E-I-Z-E. -E. Correct. Efficient. E-F-F-I-C-E. -E -E. No, I-E-N-T. Correct. Big hand. Yay. You all win. Go see Richard for your dollar. You, sh you should have volunteered. Last one. This is for everybody. How do you spell love? -E. So you think. We'll get to that in a minute. So some have stopped teaching 
this I before E except after C because they find it too confusing because of all of the exceptions to the rule that they have to explain. And then there's another set of teachers who say, no, we need to keep that rule because it gives us an opportunity to begin a discussion about all the peculiarities of the English language. Now I bring all of this up because I think to approach 1 Corinthians 13 through this lens of spelling is a helpful approach because Paul in this chapter teaches us how to spell the word love. Now I do a lot of weddings and to be honest, I am so tired of hearing this passage read at weddings. Not only is it overdone, it's not really about the feelings of love that are trying to be expressed at a wedding. Where Paul starts out, he gives his rules for love. And I want you to listen carefully to see what these rules have in common. Paul says these are the rules for love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Do you notice what all of these rules have in common? None of them are feelings. All of them are actions. So Paul's first rule about love is that love is seen in action. Love is not necessarily something that is felt with emotion. And so how I translate that to mean is when Paul spells love, I doesn't come before anything. When you love someone, you always comes before I. See, Paul was writing this letter to a church that was in the middle of division. It was finding itself with members of the faith community um, at each other. They were continually putting I before the greater you. The individual was becoming more important than the faith community. Some members were acting as if their ideas, their wisdom, their spiritual path were superior to everyone else's and they were lording it over those who they felt were inferior spiritually. And some of the elites within the faith community were harmful self-promoters. They were competitive and that was creating an unhealthy culture within the church. They were competitive in terms of their spirituality to show we are far more religious, we are far more spiritual than other people in our faith community. And those people who they were considering to be lesser no longer felt safe in expressing themselves. They no longer felt, I mean, let, think about that. They no longer felt safe in the Christian community. So in the first part of this chapter, Paul is very sharp and critical with his tone. I mean, hear those words again for a second of how he opens up. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. So obviously some in the community were speaking in tongues. Some were exercising prophetic powers. Others were claiming to understand spiritual mysteries that were inaccessible to everyone. And so that they were boasting that they had greater faith than everyone else in the church. And Paul was saying all of these spiritual gifts mount up to nothing. They mean zero without love. He makes the point that no matter how spiritual they seem to be or how spiritual they think they are, the one thing God gives and demands which can't be substituted by the religiosity or the religious show is to love others the way God loves us through Jesus. I mean, indeed, if we don't have 
that love, it doesn't matter what kind of displays we put on, they don't amount to anything. And unfortunately, we are no strangers to the kind of divisions of which Paul is talking. And we find ourselves in this moment in history in the midst of division based on race and religious identity and political affiliations and our strategies for negotiating the divisions leave much to be desired because we constantly and we continually put the I ahead of the greater you. And it often comes down to, to us choosing sides as if the spectrum in between the two poles doesn't even exist. We are so clear cut in our understanding. We think in such terms of black and white that we don't see any of the shades of gray anymore. And to make matters worse, we don't just choose sides. I mean, in fact, it would be better if all we did was choose sides. But instead, we choose the side we are on And then to make ourselves feel better or to justify our decision, we proceed to suspect and to demonize and tear down the other side. I remember Michelle would tell me this story when she first moved from Oklahoma to Washington, D.C. She eventually ended up working for a congressman on Capitol Hill. And at the time, they would have their vigorous debates on the floor of the House and on the floor of the Senate, but then after the debates were over, they would go out for a drink together or they would go out to eat together or their kids would play on the same soccer team or they'd be in the same PTA and whatever their disagreements were, they left it on the floor. But now what we see from the halls of Congress to our uh, fellowship halls to the halls of our homes are people who not just disagree but demonize the person with the other point of view that they disagree with. But as the Archbishop Emeritus of the Melchite Catholic Church in Israel said, he said, the one who is wrong is the one who says, I'm right. The one who is wrong is the one who says, I am right. And what's so sad is that most people agree often that the communal you should come before I, but saying that and living that out are two completely different things. And and one of the reasons it's so different and so hard is that putting the needs of other people ahead of our own needs just doesn't come naturally to us. I mean, we see it as a value to have a sense of compassion and empathy. I mean, indeed, we believe it's central to our Christian faith that we should love our neighbor as we love ourselves, but most people don't find that to come very easily, particularly in the Western culture. We have this understanding of the rugged individual, so because we don't find it easy, we have to continually work at it. And we have to work at it not not until we just get it right. We have to work at it over and over and over again because we often don't get it right. The tendency to put I before you is so deeply ingrained in us that it doesn't just go away because we want it to. It doesn't go away just because we start following Jesus. I mean, even unselfishness can be based on self-interest. I mean, more than one philosopher pointed out that there's often times that we make a sacrifice for another person. And the reason we make the sacrifice is not that we care so much about the other person, it's just that we don't want to appear to be selfish. And so in that very idea of not wanting to appear to be selfish, we're still putting our own self-benefit, our own self-interest ahead of the interest of another person. So how do we begin to spell love the way Paul would spell love, of putting the you before the I? We have to start with Paul's understanding of love. In this passage, Paul does not use the common word in Greek for love. He uses the word agape. And and to kind of put that into context, we have to understand that in the English language, there's one word for love. 
And it doesn't matter what the context we want to use for it, whether it's I love my spouse or I love my meal, we use that same word, and most often it's associated with an emotion. But in Greek, there are four words for love, and each word means a different thing, and so the listener or the reader didn't have to guess as to what Paul meant. They would know based on the word Paul used. So he could have used the word eros, which is romantic love, or he could have used the word philio, which is uh, friendship, or he could have used the word storage, which is a family love, or a love that you have for another member of your family. But in this passage, Paul uses the word agape. And agape doesn't describe an emotion. Agape isn't based on affection or approval. Agape is an understanding of an unconditional free gift of love. And it's a decision of the will to act in the other person's best interest, whether we feel like it or not. Agape is seen in Jesus getting down from the table after dinner and washing the disciples' feet. Agape is being willing to lay down your life for pe to save people who don't even care about you. Agape is the way God loves us and the way God act, calls us to act toward others. In other words, agape is love in action. So whether or not it's possible to put you before I in the deepest places of our hearts, even if we don't feel very loving towards another person, it's possible to behave in such a way to practice putting their interest ahead of our own. And that means that even if our inward response is what's in it for me, our outward response can be what's best for you. And we can ask that question and we can answer it regardless of what our self-interest is saying to us. So instead of seeing loving others as acting against what we naturally want to do, it's better to realize that acting lovingly is a learning opportunity. And that learning can be enjoyable and it can be a sense of personal satisfaction. So instead of, uh, let's say this a different way. In our understanding of the Christian faith, we believe that when we accept Christ, we are granted immediate forgiveness. When we accept Christ, we are granted immediate righteousness before God. But when we accept Christ, it also signs us up for a lifelong learning opportunity. And so one of those curriculum is Paul's understanding of love found in 1 Corinthians 13. He wasn't looking to write a letter that would be read at weddings. Paul was writing a letter to teach people who had accepted Christ, who he knew still needed help in living out their faith through loving action. Paul's spelling of love gives us a description of what it looks like from the outside. And so as we begin to match our behavior to that description, we learn patterns and responses that help us put the needs of others ahead of our own needs. I mean, take, for example, Paul's rule about love that's not irritable or resentful. I mean, irritation and resent, uh, resentment often spring up on their own. I don't know about you, but over these last 15 months, two years, um, I've tended to become a little more irritable. But one thing Paul teaches us is that when we begin to notice these feelings, we can make a conscious effort not to display them and not to let them drive our behavior. And as we begin to do that, we begin to exercise and beef up our compassion muscle. Or if we return to our original metaphor, when we're learning to spell love for others, we need to learn to spell it not just because Jesus taught us that, but because that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's how we show that we are a follower of Jesus, by putting the needs of others ahead of our own needs. I mean, he in fact said it's second only of importance to loving God himself. When the lawyer came to him and said, what is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. This is how we show we're followers of Christ. Well, let me close with these words from Marcy Alvis Walker. She writes, 
Why is love the most important thing above all else? Because we can't see what we don't know. So we can't trust solely in faith or hope. Both are subjective. There are many faith denominations and many reasons to hope. We can cover the entire sky with a plethora of faithfully applied theologies and practices. They vary wildly given the diversity of lives lived on this earth. Now love? Love has no denominations. It's all embracing, radiating every single ounce of light dwelling within creation. But faith and hope can wane, falter, and yes, given enough rope, destroy. But not love. Love never backfires or refuses itself or us. It loves. But unfortunately, it looks like the church has forgotten that love is the greatest thing. Throughout history, particularly in this country, Christian faith has always placed much more emphasis on being faithful to a cause, faithful to a political party, faithful to a worldview, faithful to a virtue, faithful to an ideology, faithful to a country, faithful to an identity, and faithful to a hierarchy. But causes, political parties, worldviews, virtues, ideologies, countries, identities, and hierarchies will fail us. They have done so throughout history time and time again. We can continue to be obsessed with raising an army of faithful servants to defend the faith, or we can become possessed by love and surrender our weapons of defense. There's nothing to defend when we're so consumed by love. So we can continue to be a faith that blocks what we mistrust and fear, or we can choose to become what Jesus calls us to be, a ministry of love that transcends our fears and moves into compassionate knowing. After all, Jesus never said that the world would know us by our faith and our hope. He said it would know us by our love for one another. We cannot defend or fight our way into an eternal life. Love is the only way to enter the cosmic realm of the I am that is the beginning before the beginning and the lasting ever after. Amen.